revisit that thought in a little while. So let's talk about it, this idea of experiencing eternity. You know, have you ever wonder if, if it's possible? Is it, is it even possible to experience eternity? And what is eternity? Let's, we're going to talk about this. Uh, you know, have you ever wondered what it's like? And, you know, what is this concept, this notion that you hear people talk about? Well, we're going we're gonna to unbundle this. We're going to unpack this a little bit and talk about this from a bunch of different angles, as I said earlier. I mean, this is, a, this is a topic, this idea of experiencing eternity has been discussed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, literally. It's been thought about, it's been debated by people, interpreted, it's been dismissed by many people, um, it's been embraced by many people. Um, so we're going to talk about this, and maybe, maybe in a little bit of a different way than you've normally heard people talk about this idea of experiencing eternity. So uh, <clears throat> first what I want to do is I want to read you something that I read in a book uh, recently, and I'm not I'm giving no attribution to the person or saying who it was or whatever, but this is a common description of the way people describe um, describe this, 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 this experience that they seem to be having. So here, here, here's, I just read it verbatim. So here's how it went in this book that I was reading. The person was talking about herself, an experience that she had. Here's the quote. I was sitting in the sand dunes at the beach at sunrise. The horizon began to shimmer. Then suddenly everything changed in a way I had never experienced before. The sparkle of the new sun on the water seemed to transport me to a different state of consciousness. I wasn't just seeing with my eyes. I was perceiving everything around me. I was seeing, sensing, becoming, being the sand, the waves, the endless orange and pink sky. My body was still sitting on the dunes, but I can't say I, in quotes, was sitting on the dunes because suddenly I was all energy and everything around me was all the same energy flowing within me and without me. What I normally thought of as solid matter was now a seamless reflection of all this golden energy. My body seemed to melt away totally. I became one with the sand and the surf and then for a moment with all of creation. I felt tremendously expanded and alive. Joy and relief filled my mind as I understood that I was part of something greater than the finite me. Close quote. All right? So let's talk about this. I mean, poets like T.S. Eliot and William Blake, who I studied in college a lot, um, philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, um, spiritual leaders like the Dalai Lama, I have one of his books here, uh, and the Pope, um, you know, and even comedians like Woody Allen, um, Woody, uh, I've all talked about this, this experience, and given their take on it and their interpretation of it. Woody Allen said, eternity is really long, especially near the end. <laughs> what yeah, yell cracks me up um, and so let's let's talk about this um, so what's the usual reaction the usual reaction and interpretation to that type of experience and by the way you may have had this experience or a similar experience to what I just described maybe you weren't in the sand dunes maybe you were sitting quietly on a hillside maybe you were just sitting in your bedroom I mean it could happen anywhere these experiences like this are not isolated to some, you know, uh, idyllic, uh, you know, rural setting. It could happen in the city while you're sitting in a car park, car park parked in your car on the side of a busy street in New York and Manhattan. It can happen anywhere. But many of you have, may have had this experience, and 
What's our usual reaction and interpretation of these types of experiences of expansiveness? <clears throat> our usual interpretation is that it, we're experiencing something greater than us. That's usually what people jump to. And then the next jump is that greater than us experience I'm having is not me. It's not us. It's not me. Um, and then the, the next jump after that is, oh, it must be God. It must be the universe, capital U, people who are not into practicing organized religion uh, talk about the universe or nature or the divine or something. They think that calling it, calling this that instead of God makes it not, uh, makes it non-dogmatic and makes it more open and so forth. Um, but really, that, so that's the normal jump, isn't it? That's a normal jump that most of us have. It, it's, it's okay. I under, we understand what's going on here, and we'll talk about this. But really, what's the common denominator there? What's the common denominator in the experience? Let's come back to the experience and, and not just jump to what many people's interpretation of it is, although that's what many people's interpretation is. What's the common denominator in this experience? When she was describing this, I was sitting in the sand dunes. I was seeing and sensing. I was perceiving everything around me. But then she said, so the common denominator is I, isn't it? But then she says, I can't say I was sitting on the dunes because suddenly I was all energy and everything around me was all energy flowing within me and without me. All right. That's where things start getting a little bit unclear, isn't it? People jump to the conclusion that since they start feeling more expanded and connected with something that's not their usual sense of I, sense of self, sense of themselves, that there is something outside of themselves. But she's still saying, I was all energy. Everything around me was all the same energy. It, she's still referring to me. There's still a self-awareness, isn't it? There's still self-awareness that exists throughout that experience. And I'm not going to digress too far into the 30th November discussion, but for those of you who were there on the 30th November in 2014 in the room in Washington, D.C., or those of you who've gone to 30thnovember.com and listened to the discussion by George Hammond about the information that he received, can see that many of those great teachers through spiritual history who thought they were going to merge with this oneness did not. Their self-awareness continued. Their self-awareness, their awareness of themselves as individual minds still continued after they went to the other side. Um, so let's unbundle this a little bit further. Instead of externalizing immediately, like most of us do, let's look at ourselves first in the light of in, in, in light of experience. All right. Now I want to talk about an experience that we've all had. Uh, whether we've had something similar to this experience that this woman had in the sand dunes or not, we've all had this experience. We have all had the experience of a good night's sleep, right? Everybody has. We've had better night's sleep than other night's sleeps. And when we have a really, really, really good night's sleep, what happens? We wake up in the morning and we feel really sharp. Our mind is, it's as if we have heightened awareness, isn't it? Our mind is more clear. People sometimes describe that as heightened awareness. We're more wakeful is the phrase that I like to use because it's a little bit more down to earth. We're, we're more wakeful. We're more wide awake. There's more wakefulness there in the mind. Well, let's say you go outside, and I go outside here, and it's, like I said, I've told you, we're next to this wildlife life preserve. And by the way, a couple of more deer went by during the group meditation while I was checking the time 
I had my eyes up with another little deer walking by. But let's say I go outside and I look at a leaf after having this awesome night's sleep, really well rested. I, I wake up, my mind is more clear, and I go outside and I'm looking at this tree and I'm looking at this leaf outside, our, 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 our condo here, and I'm looking at the leaf and it's like I can see the details of the leaf. It's almost like I have microscopic eyes, you know? It's like, it's amazing. It's like all of a sudden I can see, I can see details in the leaf that as if, it's as if I've never seen a leaf before. You know, you've had that experience. We've all had that experience in various ways after a good night, a really awesome night's sleep. Well, what's going on there? Is it the leaf that has changed? You know, no, it's me. It's my mind that's changed. And I may even feel really, really connected with the leaf. What does that mean? I don't know. I just, I've had that experience though, personally. I'm saying I have had this. Kelvin Chin has had this experience. I have had this experience where I've gone and I've looked at the leaf and it's like, it's as if you're connected with the leaf, metaphorically speaking. Am I one with the leaf? No. Am I made up of the same things of the leaf? Yeah. Atoms, molecules, and so forth. We're made up of atoms and molecules like a leaf is. So you could say, like she was saying, that the energy is, you know, we are made up of similar particles and similar energy. Yeah, okay, I get that. But am I, am I one with the leaf? No, I'm not one with the leaf because I'm not merged with the leaf because I would have lost my identity. I still have my self-awareness in order to experience that that's a leaf. Now I'm experiencing it, yes, in a very different way. Why? Because my mind, my consciousness, my level of wakefulness, same thing as consciousness. When people, you hear people talk about, she talks about different state of consciousness, it's just a different state of wakefulness. Yes, it's a different state of self-awareness, yes. But the mind is still aware of itself, and the mind is still aware of itself, there is individuality. And individuality is not a bad thing. But it's a connection. That connection that we're noticing sometimes confuses people. Um, there's a connection, but not with the leaf. It's as if I'm connected with the leaf. But what's the connection with? It's with myself. It's my mind after that awesome night's sleep is more connected with itself. And because the mind is much more connected with itself, it can appreciate and experience the external world, in this case, the leaf that I'm looking at, in a much different way. And for those of us who are not used to experiencing the mind in these different ways, it's like, whoa! And so we project that difference outside of ourselves. It's a normal thing to do, but all I'm saying is to be caution, be, be, is a cautionary note, to be cautious of that. Cautious of immediately jumping to externalization of that. Instead, look within ourselves, because we have different experiences all the time, don't we? This experience of belief is just one, one of many examples, millions of examples you could come up with yourself where you have different experiences of different things at different times. You have different experiences of the same thing at different times. That experience that she had in the sand dunes, where she had been many times in her life before, to those same sand dunes, was just a different experience that she was having. She interprets it in a certain way. What I'm suggesting is that sand dunes experience is... More, more because of her different experience of herself than the sand dunes itself. The sand dunes hasn't changed. She has changed. And therefore, her experience of that has what, is what has changed. Now, back to the interpretation of the experience. Again, she jumps to this conclusion that she's one with this that she became one with the sand. And she didn't explicitly say that she was 
one with the universe or with God or whatever. But very often people do jump to the, those conclusions. Um, and that they're experiencing an eternal, the, the eternity of life. Okay? So let's unbundle that part of it, the interpretation part, a little bit more. This idea that we are experiencing the eternity, this eternal aspect of life. What is time? Let's talk about time first. Time is what? Time is an arbitrary measurement that we all, that humans have created. It's an arbitrary measurement of what? It's an arbitrary measurement of the continuum of change. That's what time is, if you think about it. Um, and I say it's arbitrary because uh, those of you who have had, who have children, um, but or, or even don't have children, but who have ever been with children or around children, know that children are curious. And what do you hear children often ask? They'll ask questions about all kinds of things, but often they'll ask, like, well, you know, what, you know, what is time? You know, uh, who decided a day was 24 hours long? You know, you hear these, these, that's the great, great thing about kids. They'll just ask questions that are kind of obvious to all of us that we kind of go, oh, that's a good question. Who, you know, that's a good question. Who came up with this 24 hour thing? Who decided this 24 hours of the day? Who decided that there's 12 months in a year? Well, what about this lunar new year, the lunar year thing? You know, I, we talk about Chinese New Year's, Asian year, New Year's, that are lunar. What, what's up with that? You know, what does that mean? All of these things are arbitrary. They're a, they're a, they're a way for us to, to measure time. But what's time? The continuum of change. So it's a way to get our mind around this, this concept of change that's constantly occurring in our lives. That's what time is. And, but what about that? Even that, even that ex even time is experienced differently by different people. Even time is experienced differently by, by one person, by me. I experience time. You experience time itself in different ways at different times, don't you? When you're on vacation, time seems to pass really quickly. You know, you're not even aware of time. You know, when you're at a boring job in an office or whatever, you're doing something you're, you're, you're not crazy about, you're doing something you're not crazy about, it's time goes really slowly. <laughs> it's like, oh, look at the watch, look at the clock, oh, looking at the watch again, look, keep looking at the clock. You know, time is experienced differently by different people as well. Um, <clears throat> So let's talk about eternity. Talk about a couple of things. Time, eternity, then we'll come back and we'll marry the two up. So what's eternity? First of all, eternity must exist outside of time, must exist beyond time. And if that's the case, <clears throat> then, etern then, then it must exist outside of this continuum of change, which is what time is. Time's an me arbitrary measurement of the continuum of change. Well, eternity, which is this whole idea of foreverness, if, if there is eternity, which is forever, there's no beginning, no end, then it must exist outside of time. It must exist outside of this continuum of change, right? And therefore, this whole idea of eternity must, ex must be uninfluenced by the continuum of change also. Well, so what... So, so, so what, what is eternal? What, 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 uh, what, is un, what, what is uninfluenced by the continuum of change? Well, there's a few things that I can think of right off the top of my head um, that are uninfluenced by the continuum of change. So the existence of matter uninfluenced by the continuum of change. I'm not talking about matter itself. Matter is obviously influenced by the continuum of change. Talk, talk about the very existence of matter, the fact that matter exists outside of the continuum of change. The unchanging patterns of life. There's all kinds of patterns in life that we can that we that we experience all the time. The unchanging patterns of life, if they're unchanging, they must exist outside of the continuum of change. Our very existence itself, the fact that, I mean, I argue, now you have to. You know, I argue that we are eternal souls. 
that our souls, our minds continue forever. There is no beginning and no end. And if that's the case, then we would exist outside of the continuum of change. You may not believe, have, hold that belief, so that's okay. But <clears throat> if you do, then our very existence as minds or souls or consciousnesses as, uh, uh, exist outside of the continuum of change. So those are some things that we could discuss uh, that exist outside of the continuum of change. But the issue is this, back to this whole idea of what we're talking about, experiencing eternity, you know, question mark. Can we experience those those concepts, those things that I just described that are outside of the continuum of change. <clears throat> See, the problem is experience itself is part of the continuum of change. You know? So experience itself is part of the continuum of change because experience is change, right? So the problem with this is that we can't really dis directly experience eternity in the way that people describe. We can dance around it, <clears throat> and that's kind of what she's doing in the way her description, and that's okay. We can dance around it, but we can't really directly experience eternity, because eternity is t means it's time. Eternity, by definition, is timeless. And all of that which is timeless exists outside of the continuum of change. Experience is within the continuum of change, what we experience in life. And therefore, we can talk about this, but we cannot directly experience eternity. Now, you may say, so what? All right? <clears throat> the so what is this. Well, but before I get there, what are we experiencing? Back to what I said at the beginning, what I think we're experiencing is our own minds, but our minds in a very, very different way. So what I think she's experiencing in the sand dunes is her own mind experiencing the sand dunes, but in a very, very different way. And this goes back to the Houston Astrodome analogy that I talk about in my essays on my website. You can read that. But also in, the, in one of these um, webinars that we had, I went into detail about the Houston Astrodome, which I won't now, but you can go back and look at one of the archived videos, and I talk about, in, a, in the topics list, it says Houston Astrodome Analogy, where I talk about this big, huge coliseum in Houston, Texas, this Houston Astrodome. And instead of just that little bucket of ping pong balls down on the 50-yard line with a dozen ping pong balls or eight or ten ping pong balls bouncing in and out of it, instead our mind is exploring the Houston Astrodome, which is huge. And our mind is exploring that big coliseum, which is analogous to our mind. That is what people are unfamiliar with. And because they're unfamiliar with that, they, when they start experiencing these other nooks and crannies and corners within that huge, ginormous mind that we all have, they think, I'm experiencing eternity. I'm experiencing oneness with the universe. <clears throat> they jump to that interpretation. I say, first of all, it's, impo it's impossible to experience eternity. And you are experiencing your own mind, but a very, very different part of your mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. A very different part of your mind that you're just not used to experiencing before. <clears throat> so I think that's number one, what's going on, is we are experiencing our own minds in this very different way. One of the many millions of rooms of our mind, I talk about sometimes the mind is like a castle, and we have million room castle, and we have lived in three of them. And we're very, very familiar with three of them. And as soon as we start experiencing another room, we go into another room, the meditation helps open up these doors, these doorways into other aspects of our mind. We start experiencing a hundred rooms was like, holy cow. Now we're in thousand rooms. Whoa. But we're just scratch, scratching the surface because there's a trillion rooms in the mind. <clears throat> and we've been living in three of them. <clears throat> three or four of them. Now we're, now we're in a, a hundred of them. Now we're in a thousand of them. We feel like our mind is incredibly huge. Now we experience 
a half a million of them? It's like, oh my God, it's ridiculous, right? We experience a million rooms in that castle that is our mind. We think we're, 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 we're it's like blowing our mind, so to speak. It's like crazy. It's like, are you serious? But there's a trillion rooms in that mind. And you've just scratched the surface. And you've been living in three or four of those rooms most of your existences for, for, is for thousands of years. And now you're starting to open up the mind and experience. That's why I say turning within is so important. That's why meditation is so important. We open up these vistas, these new panoramic vistas and landscapes of our own mind, and we're just scratching the surface. So she has this experience in the sand dunes, and she's now she's now not no longer in three or four rooms. Now she's opened up the doors to, to a tenth room in her house, and she has this mind-blowing experience. Ten rooms in the house, in the castle, out of maybe a trillion. That's the perspective I want you to have about this. That's what goes on with our minds. So the other thing that is going on in the experience is not only our own mind experiencing itself, but it's experiencing the mind experiencing the vastness of reality also. Because there is an objective part of this that's outside of ourselves, which is vast in and of itself that we can experience. So there's two things going on, but we cannot experience eternity per se. That's different from the vastness of reality. The vastness of reality is huge. It is on the order of this trillion room idea that I'm talking about, where we're just normally used to experiencing reality to the, to, to the three room degree, we'll say. And then there, but it's the vastness of reality is this trillionness to it. It's huge. And that's what we start to experience. So there's a reality to this that is big. I'm not saying it's not big. I'm just saying it's not, we cannot experience eternity. All right? We don't merge with the oneness and become nothingness and become the oneness. That is not what happens. All right? Because you can't have experience then. And the experience of people, great teachers from the 30th November talk, who've been here around here many, many times, is that so far, everybody's is still experiencing their individuality, but in this different way that I'm trying to touch on here. All right? <clears throat> so again, back to the so what, and I'll just close with this thought, because we're coming to the end of our hour here. Um, the so what... The bigger picture, so what, is that there is no one way to experience this. There's no one way to experience the sand dune experience. There's no one way to experience eternity. If you want to call it God, you want to call it oneness, you want to call it the universe, I don't care what label your belief system makes you feel comfortable calling it. You can choose whatever. I'm not making any judgments about that. People can call it whatever they want. That's fine. <clears throat> What I'm saying is, if we unbundle this, there is no one way to experience this. That means there's no one right way to experience this. And if we realize this and embrace that there are a whole bunch of different ways to experience this expansiveness, however we want to define this idea of eternity, however we want to define it, in term, if, whether it's religious, cultural, I don't care what labels you use to, to define that it. But there are many, many ways. What that will do is open our minds up to accepting other people's experiences of life, starting with this. Because so many wars have started, been started and never ended over this experience that somebody has had or some people have had or claim to have had. And what I'm suggesting is that opening our minds up and realizing that there's no one way to experience this, that there are many ways to experience this, would bring us closer together as a world community, as human beings, as individuals. And I, I would suggest that this could lead to a more peaceful world. 
by opening people's minds up to thinking about this more clearly, by unbundling the package somewhat. And I'm just doing my, my small part in planting the seed now and for future generations because I firmly believe that these videos and that you've been part of will continue for thousands of years, that people will continue listening to these discussions that we're having for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years after I'm long gone. So I'm planting seeds for people to think about these things. Back to what I said at the beginning of the day today in our discussion, in our webinar. Planting seeds, not because you have to believe what I'm saying. In fact, I am suggesting and encouraging you the opposite, to not believe what I'm saying, but to think about this differently from your own perspective and using your own mind and your own belief system and your own culture and whatever, and to think about these things in these different ways because I think by thinking about these things in these different ways and unbundling these packages and thinking about them will bring us all closer together as individuals and as a world community. So thanks again for, for joining today and uh, we'll see you the next session. What is it? July. Uh, I think it's July 3rd, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, July 3rd, Sunday. So it's July 4th weekend. A lot of you may be busy doing other things, and that's okay, but I'm sticking with the first Sunday of every month just for predictability for people who want to join. And I'm going to talk about dualism. I'm going to talk about this idea of dualism or non-dualism. You know, you hear a lot about this. People, the duality of life, the oneness issue, you know, hear people talk about oneness and mer merging, oneness, all this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unbundle that a little bit and talk in detail about that uh, because a lot of spiritual teachings talk about non-dualism, that that's, that's the objective. The goal is non-dualism. I'm going to unbundle that thinking a little bit on, on July 3rd. It's going to be a very interesting discussion with you. Um, and any questions, of course, feel free to ask, uh, whether it's about the discussion we had today or whether it's about meditation, anything. Always feel free to contact me, email me. Great to see you guys again. And uh, thanks for joining. We'll talk to you again in a month. See you.